Okay. So, uh, as I said before, I've broken um, this particular lecture up into several different parts because it's a huge module. So uh, you should have already watched parts one and two of Ancient Greece. Um, in part one, we talk about the geometric and orientalizing periods and the beginning of the archaic period, including Daedalic art. And then in part two, um, I really get into um, the oops, we're still in the archaic, the Aegina and the transition into the classical period. And we kind of talk about different um, differences between the archaic and the classical style in ancient Greece. Um, this slide is one where we really go into those differences. Um, and then we go into the early and high classical periods and talk about the architecture and also the sculpture. And we left off here. So um, in this section, I'm just gonna talk pretty much about the Acropolis, because uh, it's kind of a major part of the classical period of architecture in Greece. So I'm going to talk about the Acropolis, and then uh, I'll have maybe one more um, lecture in the Ancient Greek section where I will talk about some of the later parts of the, the late classical period and then um, get into the Hellenistic period, okay? So now let's talk about the Acropolis, okay? So we have, um, we left off talking about Polykleitos, right? And Polykleitos is the um, sculptor who kind of defines the standard for what um, the classical, the high classical style for sculpture is going to be, what the proportions of the body are going to be. He writes a manuscript called Canon about it. He makes this sculpture as the um, sort of uh, demonstration of those principles. And this is the most copied sculpture from the Greek period that we see, okay? And so while Polykleitos is writing Canon over, and he's over in Argos, so while he's there, um, the Athenians in Athens are under the uh, leadership of a guy called Pericles, okay? And um, they're working on one of the most ambitious building projects ever undertaken. And that is the reconstruction of the Acropolis after the Persian sack of 480 BC. So we've talked a little bit about this ongoing uh, conflict um, between the Persians and the Greeks and how the Persians were just kind of beating them for a long time, right, and kept sacking their cities and raising them to the ground and burning everything down. Um, and then the tide turns, the Greek city-states all come together and uh, form a union and, and defeat uh, Xerxes and the, and the Persians, okay? So um, the Acropolis was completely destroyed. This is in Athens in Greece, and it's built into this hill in Athens, so it kind of overlooks the city. Um, <clears throat> and so, uh, talking about what led up to this, under the command of Themistocles, uh, the Athenian navy drives out Xerxes and the Persians, right? Um, and he drives them out off the uh, coast of Salamis, which we've talked about a little bit already, but just to review. And this is an island, um, Salamis is an island uh, southwest of Athens, so it's very, it's kind of nearby. And that's where that big navy battle ha happens, where the Greeks finally defeat the Persians and send them back from whence they came, and so Xerxes is defeated. Uh, in 478, the Greeks form a more formal alliance to protect themselves from any future attacks from the Persians or anyone else, but they were mostly worried about the Persians. Um, and this is called the Delian League. Uh, it was headquartered originally on the island of Delos. Delos is in the Cyclades. We looked at it on a map when we were in the um, prehistoric Aegean lecture. Um, and at first, in this alliance, all the members are equal, but eventually the Athenians kind of become the dominant force. So it's this idea that it's this equal league of different city-states that banded together to defeat the Persians, and so now they're sort of collected. It's kind of like... Um, a ancient NATO, except it's just uh, Greek city-states. 
um, and they're all pretty equal. And but then um, in 454, the Delian treasury is moved to Athens. So Athens has already kind of seen itself as sort of the big man on the council. Um, they're the richest and the most powerful, and they were um, crucial in that naval battle defeating the Persians. So they kind of feel like everyone's equal, but we're more equal than everyone else. Kind of that kind of vibe. Um, so they decide that it would be safer to move the um, Delian treasury to Athens. So this is the treasury that all the members of this league paid into so that, that should the Persians come along, they would have this money reserved so that they could um, buy weapons and fund their defenses to fend off enemies, um, particularly the Persians. So everyone kind of paid dues and paid into this with the idea that it was going to be used for defense and for war if they needed it. Um, so, uh, this treasury being moved to Athens is kind of weird to, to some of the people in the league because they're like, wait, that's all of our money. Why are the Athenians now in charge of it? That seems weird. Because the reason it was originally at Delos, centered at Delos, is because that was the most central location between all of the city-states that were part of this um, Delian League. So they moved to Athens and everybody other than Athens on the council is kind of like, oh, so Athens is saying that this is their money and they're in charge now and it's kind of a weird thing. Um, and this becomes the Athenian Empire under Pericles. So Pericles is the leader of the Athenians, and it kind of shifts this uh, un this league, this um, kind of council of uh, Greek city-states to now become an empire where he's the boss, and he's the one kind of overseeing everybody. So everyone's paid dues into this alliance with the idea that, you know, that would be money to benefit everyone. But Pericles, decides that he's going to spend it uh, on the Acropolis in Athens, in his city, that is only beneficial to him and isn't a defensive thing at all. Um, so we have these beautiful monuments, this very famous thing, the Acropolis, and it's uh, often historically kind of described as this byproduct of democracy, and uh, that's not true, <laughs> okay? So it's really a byproduct um, of tyranny and of abuse of power. So we can appreciate the beauty of these monuments and, and what they are and where they are and learn about them, but it's important to contextualize this in a truthful way because this is really someone sort of seizing all of this money that was meant to protect everyone as a defensive fund and deciding to use it to beautify his own city. So it's, it's a little problematic, okay? Um, okay, so we are going to look at four main buildings from the Acropolis, and that's the Parthenon, the Erechtheion, the Propylaea, and the Temple of Athena Nike. And so here, I like this graphic. This is um, a nice little illustration of what the Acropolis would have looked like um, historically when it was built. And then here we can really easily color coded see these four buildings that we're gonna talk about. Okay. The Parthenon uh, is probably maybe the most famous Greek building. I feel like if you had to name a Greek building, Parthenon is the one that most people would come up with, or some people might just know the term Acropolis in general from Athens. Um, so we're going to start with the Parthenon because it's kind of the really famous thing. Um, so it's the most famous structure, one of the most famous structures in the world, I would say, pretty, pretty safely we can say that. And it's called the Temple of Athena Parthenos, okay? Um, and Parthenos um, in English translates to Virgo, okay? Um, Virgo means maiden, virgin, vestal, or chaste. So that's one of the things about Athena. Because she didn't have a mother, because she just sprang out of Zeus's head, sometimes, and I think I've talked about this a little bit in the previous lectures, sometimes she is also sort of considered like the maiden goddess, okay? So she's sort of a symbol of chastity and virginity because she's not born from um, copulation, right? So, um, so that's literally the Parthenon means virgin, means the, the, the virgin goddess, basically, and is dedicated to Athena. Athena. The whole Acropolis is, is really dedicated to Athena. We'll talk about the individual components a little bit, but she's it's mostly in her honor, which makes sense because it's in Athens, which is named for Athena, right? Okay, so this temple's made, uh, it's built between 447 and 438. And again, this these 
structures already existed on uh, the Acropolis, but it was totally destroyed, like burned to the ground by the Persians. So there wasn't really uh, much of anything left. Um, most of the Parthenon's uh, peripteal colonnade is still standing. So it's largely intact, which is pretty cool. We know the architect's name. So the architects were Ectinos and Callicrates. Callicrates' name is sometimes spelled with two L's and sometimes one L. Um, both are technically correct. A lot of these Greek names that are translated from the Greek because it's a different alphabet, um, they get interpreted in different ways in English. So I've seen it uh, both ways in books and presentations and things. So either way is fine. Uh, I don't count off for spelling on your test anyway, you know this, but uh, just so you know, it can be spelled either way. Um, the monumental statue of Athena, which was originally inside the Parthenon, it's been lost to history, but uh, there was a monumental statue of Athena, and we knew that artist as well. That was made by uh, Phidias. Um, he also oversaw the rest of the temple's art and decor, so he was very involved. So we have kind of Ictinos and Callicrates are the architects, and then we have um, Phidias, who was the sculptor, but he was also sort of the interior designer in a lot of ways, because he picked out a lot of the uh, subject matter and things for the, dec the decorations. <coughs> Excuse me. Just as the spear bearer that we looked at is the epitome of 200 years of Greeks searching for the ideal human proportions, um, the Parthenon can, is often viewed as the ideal solution to Greek architectural, the similar Greek architectural quest for the perfect proportions in a Doric temple style, okay? So the perfect symmetry, um, it's symmetrical, and the perfect symmetry of the parts is expressed algebraically in a formula that they use for all of the proportions within the whole thing, and that is x equals 2y plus 1. So, for example, the temple's shorter ends have eight columns, and the long sides have 17 columns. And we get that, if we plug it into that equation, 17 equals 2 times 8 plus 1. Okay, so that formula is what they use for everything. It's the same thing, the style of eights, um, Ration, uh, ratio of length to width is 9 equals 2 times 4 plus 1. So every little, even the amount of space between the columns, everything is determined by this formula. So everything is mathematically figured out. Um, the harmonious design and mathematical precision obscures the temple's very irregular shape. So this is what I think is super fascinating. So we have this really precise ratio of all the measurements and the numbers of columns. Everything is determined by this mathematical formula. But what's really interesting is they changed things about how it was shaped to correct the distortion that happens in our human eyes and mind when we look at things. So they wanted it to look perfect even though that's not really how we perceive things. So the stylobate, which is the platform everything's built on that has the steps that go up, if you remember, it curves upward in uh, the center a little bit on both sides, and the curvature um, continues up all the way into the entablature. So the entablature, which is the straight part under the pediment, is slightly arced, and so is the stylobate, which is the platform everything's on. And um, they did this on purpose to make the building seem more dynamic. It's kind of an architectural contraposto. It also means that from any perspective, it looks like it's perfectly square because our eye can't distort it in, pers the way our eye distorts it in perspective, like things get smaller as they go away, that curve corrects it. So it just always looks perfectly rectangular, even though it's been changed and made in an irregular way to trick our eyes to see it that way. So it's super interesting. Um, so basically all these little slight changes were made to, to trick our brain into not seeing these optical illusions that would make it look less perfect. So it was made less perfect intentionally to make it look more perfect. Pretty wild, it's, it's pretty, uh, pretty smart design. Um, so it's mostly Doric, it's mostly the Doric order, um, but it actually does have some ionic elements. The ionic elements are on the inside. So the exterior frieze is Doric, the inner frieze around the top of the naos, or cella, the uh, interior part, right, is um, 
ionic, which is strange. We haven't really seen that combination before. We see that combination in almost all of the buildings on the Acropolis. Um, the explanation for this is the belief that the Ionian people of the Cyclades, so that's where the Ionian people live in the Cyclades, which we've talked about before. Um, so they live in the Cyclades, they live also in Asia Minor, and it's thought that they were descended from Athenian settlers and thus part of their kin. Okay, so this is kind of including the um, Ionic order is kind of a nod to these other people that are, they think, directly related to them, not just Greeks in general, but particularly related to, to the Athenians, which is kind of interesting. Um, and as I said before, uh, Athens is named for Athena, which we'll talk about the myth that leads, the, the story that leads to that uh, a little bit later. Okay, so you, we can see on the plan it's uh, quite symmetrical on the vertical axis. We have a little bit of differentiation on the interior, so it's not totally symmetrical if you fold it uh, in half horizontally, but you can see it's very perfectly designed. This is also a nice image because it tells us what uh, we have been shown to us in the friezes, in the sculptural friezes. So. Um, on one end in the pediment, we have the contest between Athena and Poseidon for who will be the patron god of Athens. Athena wins, and we'll talk about that story later. In the metopes on that end, we have the battles of the Greeks and the Amazons. And on uh, in the metopes on the other end, we have the battles of the gods and the giants. So those two things, and then also the battles of the Greeks and the centaurs and the battles of the Greeks and the Trojans, those are all meant to show uh, a kind of similar victory of the refined uh, Athenians, of the refined Greeks, over these um, kind of uh, barbarous other groups of people. So um, that's meant to be a metaphor uh, for the defeat of the Persians. So this idea of the Greeks defeating these other, these outsiders, these people, from, and groups of individuals from outside of Athens, outside of Greece. Um, so the, the reason those battle scenes are chosen from their different legends is because that's how they saw the Persian battle as well, the defeat of Xerxes and the Persians. They also saw that as them, like the, the conquering of reason and order over chaos, which, you know, it's just, it's bias. It's from their perspective. So they think they're the reasonable ones, obviously, because they accept their own culture. Um, and then the other pediment is uh, Athena's birth, her springing from Zeus's head, which makes sense because this is dedicated to Athena. Um, and then we'll see on the inside the great statue of Athena, which has been lost to history. <coughs> Excuse me, my goodness. Um, okay, so this is a replica of the statue. We have a really good idea of what this thing looked like because um, there were lots of copies of it. There were copies of it, there were really detailed descriptions. So this is by um, Phidias. So it's Athena Parthenos. Parthenos, again, meaning virgin. It was built in 438 BC and it was 38 feet tall. So it was very large. It was a very, very large monumental sculpture. Um, the original is lost, but we have reconstructions. Um, there were Roman copies and really detailed descriptions from many Greek and Roman writers. So we know a lot about it. We have a really good idea of what this thing looked like. Um, it was chrysolephantine. Chrysolephantine is a hard word for me to say. Um, and that just means that it's made out of, it was made out of ivory and gold. So this was very, very precious and very, very expensive to make. Much more expensive than making something out of marble because ivory and gold were very, very expensive materials. And to make something 38 feet tall, entirely of ivory and marble, as you can imagine, was extremely expensive and costly. So again, this comes in this idea that Heracles is using all of the defense funds gathered from the whole league of people to, to um, fund this, this undertaking. Uh, so we can see her here. She is holding in one of her hands Nike. Nike is the winged uh, victory, so the winged personification of victory. Nike is very much affiliated with Athena. Sometimes they're considered, um, the Nike is considered just a different um, entity that is also Athena, um, but it's the symbol of victory, victory in battle particularly. So she holds the Nike in her hand. Um, this particular Nike refers to the uh, Athenian defeat of Persia in 479, right? Because this is, again, Pericles kind of flexing on that. 
Um, and there's a lot of the same kind of storytelling and imagery um, portrayed in this sculpture that there is in the uh, temple at large. So for example, on her sandals, the soles of her sandals are very thick, and along the outside, it's the uh, Sintaramaki, which is the defeat of the centaurs, who are considered this kind of barbarous foe. Um, Theseus was very important in that battle. Uh, on the exterior of her shield, there was a high relief sculpture of the Amaz Amazonamaki, which is uh, the defeat of the Amazons. So again, Theseus is involved. He drove the Amazons out of Athens. Um, inside the shield was a painting of the Gigantomachi, which was again the defeat of the giants. So the giants were attacking and the Athenians defeated the giants as well. So each of these um, mythological contests alludes to the triumph of order over chaos. And the, the Greeks, particularly the Athenians, really saw themselves as the representation, kind of the manifestation of order, okay, and all that is like good and virtuous in the world, which is, you know, a little self-serving, obviously. Um, but basically, civilization over barbarism, Athens over Persia, all of this is, is kind of tied in thematically to all of these things. Um, so again, these same uh, themes are taken up in the Doric metopes around the exterior of the building. So here are some from um, the section that is dealing with the Sintaramaki, which is the defeat of the centaurs. So we can see here um, we have a uh, Athenian man uh, defeating a centaur in the first. In the middle, there's a uh, centaur who's trampling an Athenian warrior. Then we have these two battling. So it's kind of all the way around. And uh, a lot of these do still exist. So we have some of these still exist. Um, not much of the sculpture from the pediments still actually exists. Um, the main piece that does exist is shown below but there are very detailed drawings of what it looked like from different Roman and Greek artists. So we know what it looked like, so there have been some different little reconstructions. This is a small scale reconstruction, but I think it's really nicely detailed. Um, so we have the east pediment, which depicted the birth of Athena. So that's what's happening here. Um, and we can see the uh, Athena is springing forth out of her dad's uh, see. Is that what this is? Hang on. Yes. Okay, so we have uh, the birth of Athena springing out of her dad's head, and there she is just standing in front of him like, here I am, shield, spear, I exist. And the pieces that are left, we have um, Apollo and his horses. We also have Hestia, Artemis, and Aphrodite. They think. It's hard to identify which goddesses were here, but that's, that's what's Thought to be depicted and you can see this is the section in the lower left over there that that exists um, this was the west pediment of the parthenon and so this shows the contest between athena and poseidon to see who will be the patron of athens and we're going to talk about that some more when we get to the erechtheon um, but basically they both wanted athens to be their city because they thought it would be the greatest of the greek cities this is again told by the athenians so it's it's very much in there um, kind of uh, tooting their own horn as it was, but basically they both wanted to be the, the patron, the, the god of the city. Um, Athena wins, spoiler alert, that's why it's called Athens, and we're again going to talk about it a little bit later, but this is what's being portrayed here, um, which is strange, right? So we have, um, it's strange because we have gods trying to impress humans, which is sort of backwards of most of what we've seen so far in these other cultures. It's always the humans trying to impress the gods and trying to do all the things to, to um, do well by the gods so that they have a nice afterlife and so that they have good you know, crops and good life and whatever. Um, but here, the gods are trying to impress the mortals, which is weird, right? It seems a little strange. So it's kind of an interesting story. So we'll talk about it. Uh, one thing I do want to talk about here, and we'll maybe go back to this slide when I talk about it, is I just want to make a note about the Elgin marbles. So you may have heard of the Elgin marbles. Um, this temple was, the Parthenon was more lavishly decorated than any Greek temple before. Um, all 92 of the Doric uh, metopes had relief sculpture. There were 524 feet long ionic friezes inside that um, 
totally were covered in relief sculpture. This is like a massively decorated thing. The pediments were filled with larger than life sculptures. And then, so between, so just to kind of tell you what happened here, um, between 1801 and 1812, Greece was under uh, Turkish rule at this time. Okay, so Turkey is largely what was part of the Persian Empire. So in the 1800s, that late, there's still like Turkey and Greece fighting. Turkey is ruling over Greece at that time. Um, and there's a British guy named Lord Elgin. And he was the British ambassador to the Ottoman court in Istanbul. That's in Turkey, that's the Ottoman Empire, that's kind of what the Persians become, basically. Um, some of them, the, the per Persia was huge, it was in parts of Iran and all of it, anyway. So, okay, Lord Elgin, he's the British ambassador to the Ottoman court in Istanbul. Because of this, and because Greece was under their, under Turkish control, he was allowed, Lord Elgin was allowed to go into Greece to the Acropolis and dismantle the Parthenon sculptures and ship them um, to England. So he took all the best preserved sculptures from the Acropolis and some other places, but predominantly from the Acropolis and shipped them back to his home in England. Um, and they're now displayed in the British Museum in London. You can go see them. I've been, I've spent a lot of time at the British Museum when I was in school. Uh, you, you can go see them there. Um, and it's a controversial thing because um, Greece has been trying to get them back pretty much since they were taken. So Greece has been trying to get them back for a really long time and they've tried legal appeals, they've tried all kinds of appeals to try and get them back and uh, the, the British have just said no, basically. And so um, it's hard because on one hand it's like, well, we want people to have their cultural works where, with them, where they belong. On the other hand, many of the works that were left in Greece during Turkish rule were completely destroyed, were totally destroyed, um, and I mean like smashed to bits. So a lot of what is left and in good condition is because it was kind of stolen by people like Lord Elgin and moved to other museums to be um, saved basically and preserved. But now that Greece controls Greece again, it's like, well, shouldn't the British give them back? And it's like, it's a hard, it's a tricky thing. And it's not a singular incident. There's lots and lots of things like this throughout art history. And it's one of the um, lasting effects of colonization in cultural areas. And in, uh, you know, when we look at museums and who has what and that kind of thing. So it's just a thing to, to keep in mind that the reason a lot of this stuff is preserved and we have it is because it was taken away, but it's also like, it's kind of icky feeling, right? When you think about it, because it's like, well, shouldn't the Greeks have their statues back? But I don't know. So it's very, it's a tricky thing, but I just want you to be aware of it, okay? Okay, let's talk about uh, other buildings at the Acropolis. So this is the Propylaea. Um, there are a couple of spellings of this, again, like I said, when we're translating from a different alphabet, a language that has literally a, a different alphabet than ours, it's a little different. So sometimes it's P-R-O-P-Y-L-A-I-A, -A, and sometimes it's E-A, I've seen it both ways, so just either way is fine. Um, okay, so this is basically, um, Propylaea means a gateway, so this is a monumental gateway, um, and it literally means um, entrance to temple, basically, enter the temple this way. Um, it's a really, it was a really difficult thing to build um, because it's on this extremely steep slope, this really steep incline going up the Acropolis. So the architect was named uh, Nisocles and he split it between two levels to accommodate for how steep uh, the ground was. Um, and it's interesting because we have mixed Doric and Ionic styles here again. Um, because of Athens, um, the, because they're the ones building this, there's a big change in fortunes um, after the Peloponnesian War out, uh, begins in 431 BC. So this is never finished. So it started at the same time as all the rest of this Acropolis stuff. And, um, it, it's a very ambitious building 
and then war breaks out again and it never gets done. So there were supposed to be two kind of side wings, you can see in the drawing over here, there's supposed to be two side wings that come off of it, um, and only one was ever completed. And in Roman times, this, um, this was uh, the, the wing that was completed, housed a uh, Pinacotheque, which is a um, picture gallery. Uh, so it's not known if that was the function of it for the Greeks when it was originally built, but if it was, then the Propylaeus Pinacotheque is the first recorded structure built for the purpose of displaying paintings, meaning it is the first art museum, which is kind of awesome, I think. I mean, being a big museum nerd and an art history fan, I think that that's pretty rad. So in theory, this is maybe the first art museum, as well as the big gateway. One of you is writing about the um, processional friezes inside the Parthenon that show this procession of Athenians um, that's celebrating Athena on this special day. So one of you is gonna write about that in the discussion. So this is where that procession would come up the stairway uh, and through this gateway. So they'd go, they parade through Athens and up the, these stairs. Okay, so let's look at another building. This is the weirdest building in classical Greek architecture. So I like it because it's so irregular and strange. <laughs> Um, so this is the Erechtheion, and it's uh, at the Acropolis in Athens. It was built between 421 and 405 BC. Um, so 421 is when work on this thing starts. And um, it was originally the idea that it was, it was that it was built to replace the um, archaic temple to Athena that had existed almost on the site, a little bit to the side of where it is. Um, and the Persians raised it, they burnt it to the ground, it was gone. I mean, it was completely destroyed. So they wanted to replace this, but they have the Parthenon, all of these things are kind of dedicated to Athena. So there's this idea that instead of just building another uh, temple to Athena up on the Acropolis, this would be a multiple shrine. So not a traditional classical temple, but a shrine to multiple figures that are important. So it honors Athena and it houses the ancient wooden uh, statue of Athena that has its own legend and is kind of where that procession that one of you is going to tell us about, the that the processional friezes from the Parthenon show. So this statue, this wooden statue that's very ancient and was housed here is where that procession went to. Okay, they go up to that statue and, and honor it. Um, but it also has shrines to a host of other gods and demigods who were important to Athens history. And it has a very legendary history, okay? I mean, all of Greece is kind of built in legend and myth, but uh, Athens particularly has a very legendary history. Um, so, uh, what is it, who is it named after the Erechtheion? That's an interesting name. Um, Erechtheus is one of the people who's honored here, and he's actually buried here. We have his tomb there. Uh, he was a very early king of Athens. And it was during his reign that the wooden statue of Athena that was also housed here um, supposedly fell from the head of heavens and was like bestowed upon the people of Athens. So it's a really important uh, statue. So he's buried there, this early king, and the statue is presented there. Another person uh, buried here is uh, Cacrops, and he was another king of Athens. Um, he's said to have judged the contest between Poseidon and Athena. And on that note, this is actually built on the site of that contest. So let's pull up the plan and we can talk about it a little bit. So if you look at the plan up here, look how wonky it is. It's so different than all the other kind of classical symmetrical temples. Um, but if you look at the plan, you can actually see there's the saltwater spring and trident marks. So that is actually, um, part of this contest and so is the sacred olive tree right over there. So what happened, Athena and Poseidon both want Athens, which is we're told to be the greatest city in Greece, blah, 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 blah. So they both want it to be named after them. They both want to be the patron of this great city state that's coming up. And so they have a contest and they have the Athenians judge it, particularly the king, uh, Karktops. So Poseidon to show that he is the most powerful and would be the best, um, god to be their patron, takes his trident, his big fork thing that we've talked about that Hephaestus made for him, and he strikes the, the rock, he strikes the rock in the Acropolis, 
and water starts coming out. And so he build, he makes on the spot this uh, saltwater spring, okay? And he says, see what I can do, see how powerful I am. I am the ruler of the oceans. Obviously, I should be your god and patron. And Athena watches this, and remember, she's the goddess of wisdom, okay? So she's kind of sly. And she's like, okay, okay, Poseidon, okay. And she goes over and she makes a olive tree grow and bloom and make olives. And she says, he has given you salt water, which you cannot drink and is not useful to you. I have given you an olive tree. You may, you can eat the olives, you can press the olives for oil, which is important for your nourishment and food and for your ceremonies. So she's like, look how practical I am. I can make an olive tree grow out of the rock. What about that? And she wins. They're like, oh, olive oil, that's really important to us. That's fantastic, great. You get to be the patron, we'll call ourselves Athens. And so this is supposed to be the site where this actually happened. So there are actual like marks that are supposed to be the trident marks where he struck the earth and then his saltwater spring, there's a saltwater spring. And then uh, there's a very old olive tree that is the supposed to be Athena's olive tree. So it's kind of neat, you know, um, it's kind of a fun, it's a fun thing. So, so part of the reason that this plan is so bizarre, the plan of this building is not symmetrical and is very, very strange, is um, because it was built around things that already existed and they wanted it to incorporate all of these things. And of the buildings, it's the only one who we, we don't know the name of the architect. And my theory is that no one wanted to claim it because it didn't follow the Ionic or Doric, like the strict order. But it's kind of neat. I like it because it's so strange. So things that are already existed. We had Kikrop's tomb. That's the uh, king of Athens that judged the contest. We have Erechtheus's tomb. That's the guy who was the king when the statue fell to earth. We have the olive tree. We have the saltwater spring. So they're like, OK, we have to build all this stuff into this one thing because they decided it would be one multifunctional building which is kind of interesting so that's why it's built strangely that and also um it's a very uneven terrain okay so it's very hilly rocky uneven so they couldn't correct it because if they did they would mess up the tombs or the they're afraid they'd hurt the spring or the tree or something so instead of correcting it they just built it so not only is it not symmetrical it's super asymmetrical it's also on four different levels so there are like weird stairs inside that, you know, it's, it's off a little bit, which is kind of interesting. Um, the most famous feature is the south porch, which is where our uh, caryatids replace the columns. So that's what these things are called. These are statues of women that are there in the place of the columns. And below I have something that shows what people think they might have been painted like. So they're really interesting because they have a stiffness that shows strength and support to replace the columns, but they also have a fluidity and a naturalness to their body type and the way they're all standing in contraposto stance and you can see their leg through their drapery so that you can see this nod to the classical ideas about naturalism in the body. So they're a really interesting kind of feature. Okay, so uh, the last Acropolis structure we'll talk about is the Temple of Athena Nike. So we talked about the Nike already. That's the um, personification of victory. It's the winged victory. Um, and this is by Callicratus, and he's one of the two architects who built the Parthenon. He most likely, his most likely contribution to the Parthenon is the ionic elements that um, are on the inside of it. I, that was his preferred style, was ionic. And you can see that here. We have ionic columns on the outside, right? Uh, this particular kind of um, ionic temple is a specific. It's called um, amphiprostyle, amphiprostyle. And so that means it has four columns on the east and west, and it doesn't have columns on the sides. So it's a really particular kind of design. Um, and this Nike uh, is also in reference to the victory of the Persians. So all of this stuff here is celebrating Athena, and it's also particularly celebrating the victory over the Persians. So the Acropolis has like this dedication to their goddess, but it's also like, we won, we got Xerxes out of here, we're the victors. Um, so the image of Nike, uh, is repeated numerous times in the parapet. So the parapet is the um, kind of low wall that goes around the outside. 
and each of those um, elements, sculptural elements in the frieze is an image of the Nike doing something different. Um, so part of the frieze up on the top there shows the uh, Greek victory over the Persians at Marathon, which is kind of interesting because it's showing um, a human event that's just mortals that doesn't have anything to do with gods or demigods. And usually in our friezes and entablatures and pediments, we have something that um, is either a god or the child of a god who's usually a king or something. But here we have one that is just humans. Okay, so it's the victory of the Greeks over uh, the Persians at Marathon. We also, on the inside of the Parthenon, in that uh, processional of different people from Athens doing the processional for the um, feast day for Athena, which one of you is writing about in the discussion, that's also depicting a human thing, but it's like a human worshipful thing toward a god, and this is a particular battle, so it's kind of an interesting, it's an unusual subject for a frieze. Um, and likewise, some of the um, images of the Nike are really unusual subject matter too. So this one I've pulled out for you is my favorite. Um, and it's right at the beginning here. And this is uh, Nike, the winged victory. And she's stopping to adjust her sandal strap, which I just think is like kind of funny that that's something that someone carved in a sculpture. And it's interesting because this should be, you know, like, totally awkward and weird and off balance. Like if you've ever tried to stop and adjust your sandals standing up, it's not a comfortable thing. But the sculptor is really kind of showing their skill here because it's rendered so gracefully. So this sort of banal basic thing of like adjusting your sandal is being done by a goddess here. So it's very beautiful, even though it's an awkward kind of movement. And the sculptor is also showing us just the their ability with marble and, and just depicts this kind of grace and the human body and drapery. So we have her robe, looks like it's translucent and thin and kind of clinging to her body. And the reason for that is so that they can show all the naturalistic kind of anatomy underneath, because this is the high classical period where they're really interested in um, showing the depictions of the body in a naturalistic way. But this is a woman, so she still has to be clothed at this time in Greek history. So they're like, okay, I'll clothe her, but it's going to be really thin and clingy <laughs> so that I can show that I know what human bodies look like, even though this is a goddess, right? Not a human. Um, so it's pretty interesting uh, to, to think about the different stylistic decisions that go in here. Um, okay, so I think, let's see. Okay, so I'm going to stop there, and then next time we're going to talk about the late classical period and probably get into the Hellenistic period. Okay, thanks.